Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. I want to let you know that uh, we noticed Wednesday evening, and I can't, don't know why, but the back four speakers just stopped. So all we, all we got is these front two speakers. So we tried to turn them up some without blasting everybody away, but let me know if we're not being loud enough. <clears throat> We can, uh, we can try to speak up and we can try to turn them up some more until we can get that worked out. <coughs> All right. So we are looking at 1 John chapter 5. We're, we're about done. We're down on question 7. Before we get started, please pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this time we have, Father, that we can come together and study your word, Father. We ask that you would be here with us, teach us and show us, guide us in your word. Help us to learn what you want us to know, Father, to help us in this life and to further your will and the Lord's ministry here on this earth, Father. We ask that you would help those who couldn't be here, Father, bless them and heal them and comfort them and, and their families and, and help them to be able to be with us in the future, Father. We ask that you would forgive us for any sins, Father, and we thank you and praise you for all your blessings, all the wonderful things you give us, Father. We thank you for being our one true God, the Almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. So we were in, let's see, we were at question seven. Let me read uh, verses 9 through 13. This is 1 John chapter 5. That's the final chapter, unless I have lost my use of math. Um, we're going to read verses 9 through 13. If we receive the witness of men... Now, you remember we talked about witness. You, you can better think of this as maybe testimony. It kind of makes a little more sense to us the way we think of things. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God which he has testified of his Son. Now, it's a little too much testimony, perhaps, but it's just saying that if I say something is true, that's I guess that's well and fine, but if God says it's true, that's, that's a much greater truth, right? That means something, right? So, and God is saying this about his Son that Jesus is the one, right? Okay, so, continuing on, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So that's our verses. Now if we look at question number seven, so what has God given us? We'll take the first part of that. Eternal life, right? He's given us eternal life. And then the second part of this question says, who has this? And you could probably answer that a couple of different ways, the way that is said. But who has this eternal life then? Anyone, anyone who believes in Jesus as the Lord, the Son of God, right? Is that correct? That's what you're. That's what you meant to say, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that is okay. So yeah, it's like uh, he who has the Son of God, he who has Christ, has eternal life, right? And the reason I said that was the way it says that you could almost say, well, Jesus has eternal life. Yep, he does. That's who we get it from, right? That's who we get it from. So that makes that both of those make good sense to me especially in reference to what John is saying. Let's see. Um, for some references on that, well, one, I mean, that, that also means there's no eternal life without Jesus, right? 
We, we can't have eternal life without Jesus. If you look at John uh, chapter 1, verse 4, you'll see that Jesus, um, well, this verse says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we know that Jesus was life, right? In him was life, or is life. He has life. And then himself, in uh, Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6, also says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we have all these uh, testimonies or proofs or statements that Jesus is life. He is the life. So question eight, why did John write these things in his epistle? Right. He says in verse 13, right, that we might know that we have eternal life and that we would continue to believe, right? That we would continue to believe because that's important. It's one thing to know it, but you have to continue to know it. And you have to continue to believe it. It's easy for us to be distracted and drawn away and to forget the things of God, unfortunately. So we have to keep reminding ourselves. Yes. And uh, that's what Satan wants. He wants our faith to become weakened. He wants us to forget. He wants us to not have that hope. He wants us to feel hopeless, to feel overwhelmed, and to give up. That is what now, Satan wants. He wants us to to be distracted, to be pulled away, to have our faith weakened, and to feel hopeless, and to give up. And, and that does happen to people. Unfortunately, it does happen. Mm -hmm. We want to be aware of that, be wary of that. You know, when we're tested, and we are tested by many things, whether it's our health or finances or whatever, that gets us down. That's Satan's way of trying to pull us away. Yes. But we have a better authority and a better person if we would just go to Christ. Right. Satan. Through these times. Right. When we have hard times. Better. Yeah. When we have hard times, that's Satan trying to pull us away, right? And yet we're encouraged to redouble and to stay with God and to keep our faith, especially through those times, right? We're encouraged to especially stand and keep those times. Did you have something, Matt? Yeah, just uh, like you were just referring back to the Gospel of John, I, this is an echo, I feel, too. If you go back to John chapter 20, verse 31, John writes something very similar, as he says here. He says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The same elements of believing and life are, are uh, what he gives us the reason why he's writing that gospel as well. Right, and that's in John, did you say 20? 20, verse 31. Verse 31, yeah, he also makes a reference there to, you know, in Jesus is the life. So, yeah, that does reinforce that. Does anyone have anything else on this before we move to the next? All right. So, question nine. Oh, yeah, this is the end. I can't move it any further. I'm trying to move it. Um, what confidence do we have in prayer? Question number nine. Oh, wait. You know what? Let me read these verses here. We didn't read these verses. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. All right, so that's verses uh, 14 through 17. Now again, if we look at question 9, what confidence do we have in prayer? We know that he hears us. We know that he hears us, right? That and what? Okay, we know that he hears us, and so... What else does he say about if he hears us or? Yes, Matt. Verse 15, he says, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. 
Right. If we ask according to his will, right? If we ask according to his will, then we know that we will have those petitions, that's requests, that's what we're asking of God when even when we uh, repent and ask for forgiveness, that's a petition in a way that's we're asking for something. Just just to make that clear. So, all right. So we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, kind of a bonus question because they didn't go into it in the book here. But we look at verses 16 and 17. There's a phrase there, sin that leads to death. So what is sin that leads to death versus sin that doesn't lead to death? But let's just focus on this first. What is sin that leads to death? I went and looked for, I'm just going to give you the obvious thing that I could find that, uh, that I've always read and understood. If we look at, there's two places you can see this. If you look in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who had been, let's see, let me see if I can say this correctly. I wrote it down. They had been claiming that he was casting demons out by the power of Beelzebub, basically saying he's only doing this through the power of Satan. Okay. So, Therefore, now Jesus replied to them, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, blasphemy basically in this context is Slander, malicious talk, it's uh, injuring the good name of or the reputation of, it's lying and vilifying, okay? And that's what they were doing. Now, if we look at Mark chapter 3, verses 28 through 29, Jesus says basically the same thing, and this is uh, basically the same event being recounted. So I'm not going to read those because it's basically the same thing. He says, uh, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation. And again, that's in reference to the Pharisees claiming that he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. The problem is, and their sin is, they're purposefully teaching against Jesus and the Spirit. They would not follow God in this, even though they knew better. And they actively taught against God's plan and against Jesus and the Spirit and what was going on here. So that, and then they knew better, and we know they knew better because when Nicodemus comes to Jesus back in John chapter 3, verse 2, what does he say? He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So knowing that Jesus was from God, as many of them did, they still taught against him. They still made this claim that he was doing this by the power of Satan. So that's what I was understanding to be the sin that leads to death. Does anyone have... Yes, ma'am? This is a difficult passage as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it is. Um, it is. But another way maybe to think about it is, you know, kind of what... John has been talking out, talking about throughout the letter. Sometimes, so depending on the translation you look at, you know, he who keeps on sinning, you know, if we're in Christ, we do not keep on sinning. Uh, that language is used here in the next verse, you know, where um, verse eighteen, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin or does not keep on sinning in that continual sort of way, but the one who is born of God keeps him. Um, it, and so it seems like maybe he's saying. Uh, you know, we, we sin from time to time. We stumble and all that. That because if, if otherwise we're a liar, right? He says that too. Right. But then there's this contrast against someone who just keeps on sinning. You're just kind of like rampantly give yourself over to that. You're sort of falling away. And you're just you're all about sinning now. That maybe that that's the sin that leads to death. You're just all caught up in it. And so when we're thinking about our brother that's just totally caught up in this rampant sin, 
maybe it's not so much the sin we should pray for that he be forgiven of that sin, but we need to pray for him to be totally restored. We need to pray for him and work with him to try to get him to come back to the Lord rather than worry about those little sins because he's just overflowed in it. That's, yeah, we, that's what I was thinking. We do need to remember always to pray for those who are caught up in sin, definitely. Uh, and I think a lot of what he's talking about when he says there is sin that does not lead to death, I think that is... I think that is what we th would think of as the little sins that people do that they ask for forgiveness for, you know, and those types of things. Um, and I, I just, but I, I did read some on people saying that too, that basically there's sins that we're forgiven for that do not lead to death. And then there's sin that maybe we're so caught up in and we're doing, we've given ourselves over to it. Again, I think that still as with the Pharisees, still shows a sense of rebellion against God, refusing to submit to God, and doing our own thing. So in a way, the two can kind of tie together. Pat? I was thinking of what Matt said about not worrying about that sin so much as getting them back. And, right. Uh, you know, you see pictures of uh, somebody lost and they're out in the water and, and somebody throws a lifeline to them to bring them back out of sin. We don't talk about how they got out there and got in that trouble that they were trying to drown. We don't know if they fell off the boat. We don't know if they swam out there too far and couldn't get back. We don't question it. All we want to do is get them back. Yeah, the first thing we need to do, that's actually a very good point. The first thing we need to do is try to save the person, right? Whatever their problem is, we can, we can deal with that. But the first thing we need to do is throw them at lifeline and try to pull them back and, and save them first, right? Yeah, that makes good sense. Yes. You think about someone who's out there drowning like that and overwhelmed in that sin. My thought is that Satan deceived them and made them think, well, that water's shallow. It's okay. You can go out there. And then they went, whoa, there's where's the yep. bottom? And they were overwhelmed in that. People get deceived and tricked into going further and further out, right? Or, well, you've, you've heard of ocean's riptides, right? Um, they get deceived, they get themselves in a bad spot, and suddenly they're whisked out much further than they intended to go, much further than they wanted to go. And that, that sin sometimes is like that. It just will pull you out a lot further than you meant to go. The great deceiver, he's going to say things like that and make it seem like it's safe or appealing or it's not a big deal, it's not a problem, when it really is. Yeah. He's going to cover up the truth of it. Right. He's going to tell you, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's just a little bit. It'll be all right. And then before you know it, you're way out, out in left field. Uh, does anybody else have anything on that? That was, uh, that was a whole thing. I just couldn't skip those verses and not have us talk about that. Um, I think that's important. So if we look at, before we, uh, before we look at the next question, uh, let's look at verses 18 through 21. That's 18 through 21. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now that's this translation. We'll talk about what Matt was saying because I think that's the better translation. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So we'll look at question 10 first, then I have some other things. So question 10, what is described as the true God and eternal life? Okay, this is phrased kind of strangely, it's okay. So anyway, he says, if you'll notice at the end of verse 20, the exact phrase from my translation at least is, this is the true God and eternal life. And it's referring to the other things he said here, to know him who is true and that we are in him who is true and that we are in his son, Jesus Christ. So that is the answer they were looking for 
from that. Now, if we look at, I have some things, if we look at verse 18, because my translation says what we know is not exactly, it, anyway, it doesn't jive with other things. It says, uh, whoever is born of God does not sin. But really, the meaning of that is, if you look at other uh, translations, you look at the interlinear, it's really, uh, whoever is born of God does not keep on sinning. We're of course, we have sin, we make mistakes, but we're constantly correcting and training ourselves to do better, right? So, I did feel like what Matt had mentioned there, that we do not keep on sinning, is, is a better translation of that verse. Yes, Pat? I remember Paul saying he had to buffet his body daily. Paul said he had to buffet his body daily, right? So he would not sin, right? And I, I, I take that, I took, I took that to mean that he was training himself, right? Disciplining himself, controlling himself, right? We're supposed to have self-control. So I also made a note on that. It is actually easier to train yourself to do correctly by focusing on doing the right things than it is to train yourself by focusing on not doing the wrong things. The more you think about not doing something, the more our human nature wants to do it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But if you will instead put your focus on doing the good things, the right things, and, and focus on that, I believe that is a better way to train yourself, to discipline yourself in these, in these matters. Um, that's what works for me anyway. Uh, if I focus on being truthful and honest, then I will not lie, right? That's a basic, very basic example. So it depends on where we have our focus on. It's like we should have our focus on Jesus following him, trying to follow his example. All right, so if we look at verse 19, who controls the world? Well, uh, yeah, God I, according I, to our text, right? A, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, God actually <laughs> rules everything. <laughs> yes, I agree. But but in our text, he says that uh, the evil one, right, controls the world, basically. And uh, we need to remember that and stay on guard. That's why he mentions that, I believe, here towards the end. We need to make sure there's a couple of things he says. And it's to remind us, you know, we can't trust what the world tells us. So we have to be careful, be on guard, be aware. So, and then that brings us to his last warning. What's his last warning? Yes. Keep from right? Keep yourself from idols, right? That's interesting. He never mentioned idols, really, in the whole letter, but... But all maybe, of a sudden, maybe he kind of did because, like, all this false teaching and all this stuff that you might get pulled away from is essentially idolatry. Right. Like putting him ahead of God, and putting these false teachers who are teaching all this stuff about Jesus didn't really come in the form of a man. You're making them your idols by following them. Maybe they were making these false teachers idols in a way because even, you remember, even Paul complained saying that, you know, I'm not the one that saved you, Apollos didn't save you. You know, don't don't put your faith in the men, you know. So even even that was a little bit of a problem there. But uh, but yeah, definitely to guard ourselves against idols. And I think it's because of if we go with verses 18 and 19, especially um, we want to keep ourselves from being deceived or falling into error or sin. Right. Does so anybody have any? Yes, go ahead. In uh, connecting verse 21 with verse, verses uh, 20, 19, 20, keep yourselves from idols, he goes back to in verse 20, he is the true God. The idols are not the one true living God. That's right. We, we put things in the place of God. We might even put ourselves in the place of God. But the one true God, and the only way to have eternal life is through His Son Jesus. 
and to follow if you're not. And that is where he's putting our focus in verse 20. You're right. He's definitely putting our focus on Jesus and God, that this is the one true God. This is how we get eternal life. And then he's like, keep yourself from idols. Stay away from things that would pull you away from that belief, right? So, yeah. So, does anybody have anything else before we start? Yeah, before we start uh, Second John. All right. So I'm going to switch us over to Second John here, which I thought I had. I've lost it. No, nope. no. Nope. Well, I'll just I'll just open it. Oh wait, there it is. It's hiding on the tab. There you go. All right. So Second John. Going to start here. Let's see with. Uh, we're do, going to quickly kind of look at the introduction. There is some information here that's interesting. And it has to do with uh, the growth of the early church and the way they were spreading the gospel and what accounted for the spread of the gospel. And, you know, there's, he's saying there's multiple factors, but one factor to remember is that there was hospitality of the early Christians, you know, uh, Paul and everyone, they didn't always have a Holiday Inn to stay at every town they went to, you know. <laughs> Not everywhere you went was going to have something. Uh, so they were able to travel, though, and depend upon other Christians, allowing them to stay with them, showing them hospitality. So, um, let's see. And the, well, the author of this, he, he refers to himself in the opening as the elder, and this is John. Um, I'm not going to go through the evidence of that, but they, you know, we we have good reason to believe that is John. Uh, the epistle is addressed to the elect lady and her children, which is a little different, and um, they refer to here figuratively. It could refer to a church. Um, let's see, uh, Ephesus is, uh, the location they believe John wrote this from, and they think he wrote it around 90 to 95 AD, and this is a very short letter, and it really seemed to have two purposes, to encourage brotherly love and keeping the commandments of God, and to warn against supporting or encouraging false teachers. And then, then we have the outline here, and this is just a breakdown of this of this letter. The elders love again, referring to him as the elder, and he he does you know all through the first John especially he was calling us little children, so I mean, kind of makes sense in a way, right? Um, the elders' joy and request, the elders' concern, the elders' warning, closing, uh, the elders' farewell. So they have some review questions, which I'm kind of going to pop through quickly. You know, just who is the author, John, right? Uh, if, you have, if you have anything about any of this, you can just let me know and we'll, we'll stop. But uh, who were the original recipients of the epistle? And uh, it says a lady and her children, basically. And, you know, to some extent, or maybe, maybe by extension in a figurative way, perhaps a congregation, uh, certainly congregations like ours have studied this letter and looked at this letter, so might be some value in that. Yes, ma'am? I think I take the lady to be the church there, and then the children maybe to be the folks who've been converted and become part of the church. Right. Could be. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, that's what, there was, there was thoughts about that, yeah, being the church and, uh, the uh, folks who have been converted or the congregations, the, the, the children of God, basically. Yes? I, I've often wondered if the lady couldn't have referred to a woman who opened her home for them to regularly meet, or maybe her and her children opened their homes for the church to meet. Well, and 
I have there there is that thought too that it was actually to a woman who had opened her home to um, like we were talking about before to uh, say a traveling minister or John or Paul or anyone like that or uh, like you're saying to the church in general to have meetings there in their home. Yeah, there is that thought and possibility. It's interesting if you, if you do take it to be a, a woman, the, the lady, the, the word for that is really the feminine version of Lord, like when Jesus is called Lord so huh. often. And, and sometimes men of prominence are, are called that word, mm -hmm. sort of like sir, we might say. So this is a very respectful way to refer to whether it's the church as a whole or whether it's a woman of prominence there, that sort of the feminine equivalent of Lord. Yeah, that makes sense. That kind of goes with the old, if you think about the old English, right? Lord, the Lord was the guy, the, you know, who had some prominence, maybe a little bit of ruling or a little uh, duchy or something. And then the lady, the lady was the dame. She was, you know, she was his, like, since you couldn't say queen, but she was basically his equivalent. So, yeah, so to just say woman wouldn't be a good translation. Right. Right. Words and ladies. Right. And I might have said woman, but anyway. But yeah, good point. Yeah. It is it is important that we try to be accurate, so um number three, uh when was it written? They said about ninety to ninety five AD. And what was the suggested purpose? Uh to encourage brotherly love and to warn against supporting or encouraging false teachers, right? Uh, walking, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading the answer before the question. Question five, what has been suggested as its theme, which kind of goes to me with the purpose, but uh, walking in truth and love. And then what are the main divisions of the epistle? And, and we talked about that, uh, verses one through three being the elder's love, four through six being his joy and request, seven through eight being his concern, and then his warning in verses 9 through 11, and then his farewell in verses 12 through 13. So if we look at the second letter of John, and there's only one chapter, and that's, I'm probably going to say like chapter 1 various times, but there's only one chapter, so it's just the second epistle of John, it's Second John. So what are the main points? Uh, and again, we're breaking it down pretty much along with the other things we discussed. Uh, greetings, verses 1 through 3. Walking in truth and love, verses 4 through 6. Beware of deceivers and false teachers, 7 through 11. And then a farewell in verses 12 through 13. So let's read the first three verses. Maybe we can do a question here. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only, well, hold on, sorry. To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So if we look at question two, what four phrases related to truth are used by John in this greeting? And Well... See, he mentions these four things, and it's kind of, again, this is kind of maybe kind of an awkward question, but um, he mentions love in truth, known the truth, truth abides in us, and truth and love. So what is being stressed here? I think that's the idea. What is being stressed here? in those verses, and especially those re uh, remarking, you know, about love and truth. 
Love and truth. <laughs> They're being stressed. <laughs> yes. Well, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Love and truth is being stressed. Yes. How important truth is and the value of it is. It's so high. We must. We must esteem that and make that you know prominent. But it has to be with love. Saying, "Oh, I, I know the truth. I have it. I and you don't know it. You're not talking correctly. I have the correct understanding, and you don't." If we have that attitude and we're not loving. Right. Well, that's a good point. He's stretched. He's stressing the truth, but also the truth in love. We can have the truth and speak the truth, but if we if we're not loving about it, if we're hmm, very bad about it, people aren't going to want to hear that. Right? People aren't going to listen to that. So it's important that the truth is very important, especially we see that nowadays, a lot of craziness out there. The truth, reality, and facts are important, but we must express the truth in love also. And, you know, God is truth, right? The Lord is truth, and that abides with us, and it's, it will be with us forever. Um, they will be with us forever. So... It's it's an important thing that we we do have and recognize the truth. Yes. Our society today and culture we're just surrounded and permeated by so much negativity towards God's word and His truth. And you know, if you try to share a bit of the word with someone, and it could be simply that God made both men and women in our society today, you will be attacked you will be attacked, and they will question that truth. Right. In our society today, they don't want to accept the truth, not even real truth, scientific truth. They are more liable to say they they have their truth, and, and we can't really have our truth. There is the truth, and there is reality. There is not our truth. The grass isn't purple because I say it is. It just doesn't work. That's not the way it is. So we can claim all kinds of things, but that's, yeah. But it's really, it is very important that we recognize the truth and that we speak that in love. And a lot of that, the main point here, I believe, being about God and God's truth, the spiritual truths, uh, the ministry of the Lord, and the fact that, again, looking back at First John a little bit, and the fact that, um, these false teachers are wrong and that Jesus did come in the flesh and he did all of this for us and our life and our eternal life is in Jesus. That's probably one of the most important truths. That's probably the most important truth for all of us, right? So we're out of time. Does anyone have anything else before we end? All right. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. We'll pick up with question three next week.